as we get started uh, today. Um, this is our, our sixth and final installment of uh, this year's Deep Equity Series. Um, and we wanted to end today by having a conversation, um, Dr. Velma Cobb and I, uh, just about what we've learned. Um, I've been on a reflective journey over the last few years, really, I think probably since COVID, uh, where you know, I've I've really tried to in in every opportunity that I get to be reflective about, you know, what is the 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 deeper meaning behind the experiences that that we have, and in particular when it comes to series such as the one that we've done. Uh, this year, you know, what can we take back from it? You know, you get so inspired in the moment. Um, and then unfortunately, sometimes that inspiration gets lost as soon as you get off the meeting, uh, you have to answer emails or, you know, your phone starts ringing, you know, essentially life happens and that inspiration gets lost in, in the chaos of life, right? And so, have an opportunity to kind of self-reflect and be intentional about thinking about how we move forward, I think is extremely important. And so that's really uh, what today is all about. So before we get started, I will, you know, uh, hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Cobb, and, and uh, then we will get this ball rolling. All right. Well, thank you. And I'm glad that you said what you said around self-reflection. I would say that that's true. Um, we many times do not take the opportunity to uh, do that kind of inner work, um, to do that self-reflection. And it's interesting because I'm reading uh, John Ginwright's uh, work right now uh, around four pivots. And he talks about that, that if we're going to do this um, kind of uh, work around racialized bodies and this work around issues of equity and social justice, then we do need a um, to take those periods of self-reflection. I think people, you know, I mean, again, and society does that, um, makes us think that what is outward facing in terms of what we see, that that's the most important thing. But I truly believe that if we're going to um, have any kind of transformation around these issues, then it really is starting with each one of us um, doing, taking the time for that self-reflection and that inner work. Because I think unless you can't do the outer work until you do the inner work, or at least that's the way I look at it. So thank you. It, this is good to be in conversation. Uh, and I always think that you're so good at these conversations and, and um, you know, just going back and forth. And, and yes, I think I, 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 I'm so used to others looking and, and uh, my CA that in terms of presenting that um, it get lost. But I too learned a lot. I think it was a very wonderful um, series that interweaved various components around equity, like different perspectives. And so the fact that we could look at, um, you know, leadership from the, you know, the three deans and then look at uh, historic serving institutions. And there was a lot that I didn't know about that. And then also look at the intersectionality uh, with Dr. Moore. And then of course the neuro kind of neurodiversity and then end that up with the conversation with the principals. It's like, it, you know, it, we could go on and on. So thank you. Good to be here with you. So with that, uh, I would love to uh, start with uh, a simple question. We, uh, we had a conversation or, or we, we had an email conversation earlier this week where we were just kind of asking each other, like, what are some questions that we want to come in uh, to today with? 
and there was one that I specifically asked about the academy, but uh, just to start us off, how has your understanding of deep equity grown over the last six weeks? Mm. Well, um, one of the things is that uh, I'm so glad we included the piece around uh, Hispanic serving institutions, because that I thought was phenomenal in the sense of uh, the definitions of them, the fact that New York, and I am based in New York, uh, that we have 35, but she also talked about um, kind of some of the, um, the needs around that, the, the racial equity issues, because an institution can apply to be considered a HSI, um, but in fact, while they have that, that, that um, uh, designation, it may or may not mean anything in the sense of, of where, you know, like, you know, they, they write, they, they fill out an application for this designation and then they become a HSI. And it could be that the students that are on their um, campuses don't, don't really reap the benefits of that. And so one of her slides really talk about um, kind of the unnamed structural change around that is that many times the, the institutions with the highest number of actually Caucasian students actually get most of the money, <laughs> okay? So they could be like where there's some institutions uh, like, you know, University of Laverne that has like an 85% designation, you know, in terms of the student body. There are some institutions because they're larger in nature that has maybe, you know, they meet the cutoff of 25% or 28%. So they get more, they actually get more money. <laughs> and then like, how does this play out in terms of what those students are receiving is, you know, it, 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 it may not be there. And that was like, whoa, okay, really? Um, so that was surprise. That was one of the things that I think surprised me in that conversation uh, because I was like, wow. And then New York having so many, and I was trying to think, well, who are they? And though I could name some, I was like, I got to go look this up because, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I had not imagined that. But anyway, so that was one of the things. How about you? What was... Uh, one of the things that struck you in this you know, series? Um, the juxtaposition between starting off with our three deans or our three higher ed leaders and then kind of ending the last session with two K through 12 administrators. Um, and I just kept this thought came to me uh, as I was really just kind of reflecting and it's what is the cost of legislating equity? Like that's the thing that I really just continue to think about is like, and, and, you, and you kind of spoke to it a little bit when we're talking about the HSIs, right? Which is for me, equity is heart work. Equity is, is soulful work. You, you, you recognize it based on kind of this visceral reaction that goes beyond just a, you know, logical thinking space, right? But it's just like, I can, I can actually feel the equity because it's palpable in this space or in this university or in this, whatever the case may be. And what happens when you begin to say, okay, but we have to legislate it for folks who don't necessarily understand equity in that way that I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we legislate it without it then losing its teeth? Right. Um, right. 
And, and that was something that I really just felt like our leaders, both at the higher ed level and the K through 12 level, really, uh, they use different language. But for me, that's how I interpret it is like they grappled with the how do we how do we legislate it without it losing its teeth? And then how do we like, you know, as individuals put our of ourselves on the line to continue to make sure that that equity is is palpable in the spaces that we are in charge of uh and and i and i've just been wondering like man like is equity destined to lose its strength as we legislate right like like or are we able to get to a place where we can legislate equity and it still maintains its bite um, because it it hurts to hear that like hey you know the HSI designation is supposed to be a benefit to a particular population of students but the way that it has been legislated it can actually be taken advantage of by schools that have high populations of Caucasian students and so the Hispanic students don't actually get the benefits of it in the way that you are intending for them to, right? And so those are the types of things that 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 I really just begin to think more about when it comes to deep equity um, and, and the conversations that we've been having. And that brings me to, you know, intent and impact. And so um I guess earlier when I started, and I guess I was talking about that kind of inner work um, and that piece of language that you do, that it, it is so, it is visceral. Um, that for me is this notion of being and belonging. And that is the, the inner work that has to be done. And how do you help people do that? And so, yes, I, I guess, I'm with you in questioning that because as I kind of watch the news and you see that, um, you know, what happens in Florida, like you can't say gay and the, um, the uh, uh, banning of books. Um, and so what you bring up is that in this, uh, regulating for equity, there's always this tendency to kind of use, I mean, if you think about it over the last doing the uh, uh, Trump administration or whatever, and I, because I do a lot of training in equity, um, we almost legislated the language and all of the language that we had used around equity was turned against you know, what I thought, you know, we were trying to do with equity. And so that's what, you know, I'm just saying that that is a, um, you know, what I hear you talking about is the whole legislating or can we, we, we we're trying to promote that. And in fact, sometimes it backfires on us. And I do think actually, and sometimes I think accidentally unintended consequences and sometimes I think intentionally. And so there is this thing. And so that, I think one of the reasons why, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I bring in kind of the neurobiology and also bring in like, you know, the mindfulness and other that is that it really does come down to the heart. It does come down to the heart. It comes down to the being and the healing that people need because again, I think we started the conversation. If, if we, the only way we can get to the external work of equity is that there needs to be the internal work around equity. That soul, you know, um, uh, peace. And so that's, what, that's what's needed. So I would agree, I, you know, it, it's always a question. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and to that, you know, I was just thinking this as, as you were talking, I really do believe 
uh, Freddie says that there is no teaching without relationship. And, and I believe that to, to bite off of him a little bit, that deep equity flourishes in relationship. Yes. It, it is our connections uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It is those humanizing experiences that really brings is, you know, like when we had Dr. Nikki talking about uh, neurodiversity, right? It, it is the connections that you're able to make yes. with, with students and individuals uh, who are neurodiverse, where you begin to see, you know, deep equity, not only establish deep roots, but begin to flourish in ways that, that otherwise it wouldn't have been able to. And so as we think about it, you know, for me, it was just like, okay, I got to get back to basics. My brother said this to me the other day and I told him I was going to steal it for this, this conversation, but he says, I need to, I need to work on being human mm -hmm. because my, my interactions have been based on a dehumanized way of being mm -hmm. that, that I've been conditioned to not. And so he's like, any humanity that you've received from me, <laughs> he, because we talk in, in, in sports terms a lot, he says, any humanity you, you received from me has just been on natural ability. It, mm -hmm. it hasn't been because I've been practicing how to be humanizing is just because I have these moments where the humanizing comes out of me naturally. And he's like, I want to practice it now. I want to see if I can get better at being human and being mm -hmm. human towards myself and being human towards others. And I told him, I said, man, like, I'm like, for me, someone who engages in equity work, that's the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if we can tap into that space and tap into the space where we focus more on relationships, because that's what education is. It is a relational process that I think sometimes we, we get away from that, mm -hmm. that, that, that idea. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I do think it, it is relational. If you think about, we learn, you know, it's like, what did we learn from the series? But we also learn about ourselves. So there's always this intersection between who we are uh, and who we, you know, who we think we are that, you know, we go back and forth and who we are with our family, who we are with our community, who we are with our colleagues. And that relationship is always there. Um, and so, yes, I do think um, getting back to and, and, and doing that, and whether that is with language, uh, whether that is with um, giving people the benefit of the doubt to be curious and to serve their humanity, or their, their, uh, their voices, who they are, and truly respecting that and understanding that. And I think, um, we all need to be intentional about that and not get lost, you know, <laughs> and, and not, and not get lost in the day to day yeah. <laughs> checklist of our lives. <laughs> I love the, I love, I love that the day to day checklist of our lives. That, that is, that is brilliant. Um, all right. We look. We 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 ha we have have dived full into uh, to that just that first question, uh, but I want to make sure that we, you know, get to to other questions. And for those of uh, for I know we only have a couple of of attendees right now, uh, but that's you know I, I love this. I was telling a story the other day. My uncle is a pastor. And I remember those days when he first started his church, it would, it would only be two or three of us in there for service sometimes, but those used to sometimes be the most powerful service because of the individual attention that you could get. And so, you know, even though we're few in numbers today, uh, for uh, Dr. Gale and uh, 
Miss Marcella, if you all have have questions or thoughts, please feel free to uh, add them in the chat and we will definitely uh, get to them. Um, Dr. Cobb, one of the questions that I had asked and told you that I have been wrestling with is the question of is deep equity uh, it, uh, or is it deep equity if it doesn't extend beyond the academy? In other words, um, does it have to push beyond the boundaries of higher education in order for it to be considered uh, deep equity? And uh, before we, we dive into that question, I wanted to just see if you wanted to recap the, the five sessions prior or if you just wanted to jump right into to that question and, and see if we can get in, into the meat of it. Mm. Well, I mean, I, all of it kind of fits together. I mean, I guess I started out with the uh, HSIs, but also when we were talking with Dr. Crystal Moore around the intersectionality and her being um, a, a native person, but then uh, she hit us with all of that um, talking about um, uh, kind of uh, what struck me as I, I looked over it today was uh, uh, indigenous people needing to be certified <laughs> um, uh, uh, either like on reservations or in designated lands. And, and I'm saying, they, you know, the, the idea of, have, of them having to be, okay, <laughs> to be certified. Okay, so that, that was one thing, okay. And then, as I said, uh, starting out with our three deans who have, I think, um, continually talked about, uh, you know, uh, higher education and trying to make sure that, um, you know, uh, as I said, it, and I think I responded to you in our emails that, you know, sometimes in higher ed, we think when we add, um, uh, diversify our syllabus, you know, we add Bell Hooks, we add Sonia Chancel, we add um, uh, 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 Dr. Howard, or we add Linda Darling Hammond, that somehow, that, that, then that, that's deep equity. <laughs> like we've done it, okay? Yeah, they're on the syllabus, we're reading widely and whatever. Um, and so when you ask the question, does it need to expand? I, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's not deep equity without, you know, as I said, and I, and I borrow from uh, Cheryl Petty's work and people at Change Elemental that talked about Again, there's this internal component. You always got to be intentional and look at self. The interpersonal component of working with others, always, okay. Um, the institutional piece, okay. So what is the institution in which you are housed? What's happening there? And then systemically, you know, like what's going on in the world. And so without each one of those, without all of those layers, there is no deep equity. You can't, it, 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 it can't just be legislation. It's gotta be that and internal. So it, it, to me, it's all of that. I, I agree. Uh, I uh, think about it through the lens of gardening. Um, I have 30 fruit trees at my home. And a couple of years ago, we added drip lines because I was just watering them by hand. And my neighbor came to me and said, you need to add a drip line. And he explained to me the difference between deep watering and watering. And he said, you want the water to go into the ground as deep as possible because the deeper it goes, it will force the roots to go deeper in the ground. 
And as the roots go deeper, searching for water, it grounds the tree and makes the tree stronger. And I think that's what deep equity is really all about, is if you can find a way to, to extend its reach, to move beyond the local university and extend deep into the community, into the schools, and to the people, right? Then whatever it is that you're building, like its foundation becomes stronger because one of the things that we know is that the winds of change is what impacts equity the most. Mm -hmm. When something new, something different, whether it's opposition, whether it's a new proposal, like, we can be talking about equity today and the winds of change come and blow through and then all of a sudden equity blows off the radar. However, just because it blows off the radar doesn't mean that it's, it's lost its value. Right. And the deeper we can go with it, then we know that we're not just doing something for the moment, but we're doing something that is going to be long lasting. And I think you know, that's one, it was a conversation that I had this last week at U.S. Prep where someone was saying like, man, it feels like in our school district every three, two to three years, we're switching up. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what's worked because we don't give it enough time to work mm -hmm. before we're moving on to the next thing. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I've been really grappling with that question is because I'm looking at a lot of our responses nationwide to the events that happened in 2020 and how equity became a very popular term, but I'm not seeing necessarily the deepness mm -hmm. that, that it requires. And, and that and the conversations that I feel like we were having, I feel like all of our, our folks talked about equity in such a deep way. That, that, let me just say, that piece about our, our Native American brothers and sisters and like the process that they have to go through just to be certified, I, I kind of walked away and said to myself, we still have not learned to treat them with the respect that they deserve. Like even in our attempts to correct years of bad faith, mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we still continue treaties. to get it wrong. <laughs> It was amazing. It, it really was. I, you know, and when, when she talked about, because it's like, well, you know, a treaty is a contract. But then again, you know, the U.S., you know, like when the U.S. decided to follow the treaty, but yet sometimes the treaty, sometimes the treaty doesn't matter. Um, it, it was, it was, each one of the conversations was just so deep and almost too much to handle, quite frankly, because to me, you could have stayed on that one little piece and unpack it. You're like, really? Um, and, you know, like what, what's happening with the, you know, boarding schools and, um, you know, uh, and, 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 um, and indigenous, you know, women and all that. And, and the fact that, you know, she mentions the high suicide rate, the dropout rate, whatever. And I'm like, you know, it, it, it was, I, I think we have to do more. Um, and I, and I love your analogy, uh, though I have to come, I'm serious. It, we got to have a retreat at your house because <laughs> between the horses and the fruit trees, I am sold. I'm telling you that, you know, that there, there really does. I mean, I, I think I'll have to talk to Dr. Norton. We have to have a, a, a school of education retreat, but it has to be at your house on your property, because I'm telling you, I, I you know, I'm, I'm gonna get on one of those horses. Um, but, you know, um, so, I, you know, and I don't know, because you, you're right, what has happened over the last few years is that, um, and with the pandemic, so, so equity, diversity became popular, very popular. So it, you know, there, there's, I can't even think of a corporation or institution that doesn't have a statement. And everybody has it. I mean, you know, I think I went to ACTE and I think every 
workshop <laughs> had equity in their title. You know, you, you, I mean, you, you can't do a workshop these days at a conference without some form of equity in the title. And yet I do know and have, have felt like um, there is a fatigue happening because people are like, oh, been there, done that. Oh, I know unconscious bias. Oh, I've heard of microaggressions. Oh, I've heard, you know, like all of the terminology and folks are like, yeah, I, I do know that or whatever. And then, as I said, they go back to their daily lives and the interactions or not humane, you know, they're, they're not um, like, like nothing is taken away. You know, we fall back into what we know, which, which is really it. We fall back into what we know and how things work uh, and things continue to happen. Um, and so, yeah, that there is this um, push and pull that I think I have when I'm trying to, you know, um, you know, almost in the training or the workshops, it's like, how do you support people going deeper? Um, and, and understanding that, and I've often said this, there's no there there. You do not get to the other side, I believe, and then you're woke or it's done, equity done. Because as you just said, the win, the, something will come and then you have to, you, you, I, you have to re reassess, be intentional again. And so people think it's kind of a place to get to. Like it's, it, you know, and once I know it or I can read the book or I went to the workshop or I took the whatever, then I'm done. That, you know, starting out with, th that is not the attitude. There's, I'm not done. I, I don't know if you can be done with equity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, and I, I think this is uh, on my mind because uh, tomorrow I'm headed down to San Diego for AERA. Yeah. Uh, but you mentioned it with AACTE, the idea that higher ed, we descend upon these cities for our conferences and collectively you have tens of hundreds of presentations that speak to equity. The question then becomes, does it reverberate? Ideally, if you, if you throw a rock into a river, you will see the ripples as it, if you throw a boulder into the, and I feel like we are as a collective, a boulder that does not create ripples. Where we can be thrown in for AERA as an example, we can be thrown into the pool of San Diego those ripples should should flow out all the way to Tijuana, LA, <laughs> like because you have so much brain power. Yes. So many equity experts concentrated in one location at one time. And yet it is possible that we can all descend and then leave and there be no impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I, I kind of struggle with sometimes when we talk about deep equity is, is like, man, we we will pontificate to each other, but that pontification does not result in the material conditions of real lives being transformed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think deep equity, at least from from the conversations that we've been having over the last few weeks, that's where deep equity differs. Mm -hmm. That's why I said it's about the relate because it's impossible to not be impactful if you are engaging in true deep equitable work. Uh, but it is, it is possible to sprinkle a few droplets of equity 
And before it gets an opportunity to really sink in, it gets evaporated by the wind and the sun. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the place where I worry about most is like, Hey, are we just sprinkling, sprinkling this equity stuff around and, and it gets eliminated by all the other competing things before it even has an opportunity to be impactful. Uh, and it's definitely something where I'm like, you know, going forward into the summer and to the next year, even if it's just one thing, I want our GSOE here at Toro, California to really be able to, to measure the impact of our equity work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see we have a, a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gill. Dr. Gill said this is great information and validation. We appreciate that. Um, and then uh, Dr. Gill asked, is deep equity sustainable in higher education? Can we continue with the movement and not lose yourself or be removed from the table? Now that's deep. That's a good question. Thank you so much. Um, I, I mean, I think we're always, and I'll just jump in first, and I know you have uh, additional uh, something to add, but I would say, is deep sustainable in higher ed? I mean, I think that goes back to our understanding of knowing, okay? What does it mean to know? And uh, when we listen to the principals, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Smith, and, and even they admitted, like, you know, you, you come in, they, they, had, they each talked about uh, ritual and routine and what they did with the students and always contextualizing stuff. And so um, I think higher ed, uh, which is always thinking about, you know, like what we know. I mean, you're right, the, you know, tremendous numbers of people who are just absolutely brilliant. But in that brilliance, they think they know. So one of the things the principals mentioned is like uh, Dr. K Dr. Smith said when he went into uh, Eagle Academy in South Queens, he started um, the, uh, he brought student into the government. He says, how can you be an institution without, with students and not have them, not have their voices at the table? And so I would also say with us, um, you know, yes, our students are coming to us because they're trying to learn some content, okay? And notice I say content, okay? because they always come with a certain amount of knowledge, a certain amount of experience. They come with all of that. And I know that we have this content that we are trying to uh, share. But we, you know, how much do we know our students? And I mean the, the lives of our students. Um, and so I think it's important that we make sure we have greater number, you know, their voices and understand. And, and also wherever we are, our institution is within a community, okay? And so we need to take um, uh, the work that we do in terms of, and, and, and I know that Turo is trying to move toward that, of inter, you know, interdisciplinary so that it is not just what's in the Graduate School of Ed. You have a perfect, because you have married um, uh, School of Education with Health Sciences. That is a natural fit. But even bringing in more than that, social work or um, other disciplines, because, you know, people, we live lives in a full way, you know. Uh, and so we compartmentalize our fields as if when people go out in the world, they're just going to deal with this piece when in fact they're going to deal with, you know, students and communities. And so that interdisciplinary piece, I think, is important. And so, you know, I don't know, Dr. Gale, if that perfectly answers your question. I do think um, it can be sustainable, but it also has to be adaptable. 
to the context. It also has to be ever changing, okay? It can't rest on what it thinks, Haret, what we think we already know. And I think we do that too much. So, you know, we need those partnerships. We need these collaborations just to bring in different energy. So that would be my part of my response. You know, uh, Dr. Gill, the first thing that I thought about was um, James Baldwin, uh, when he talks about in his talk to teachers that for those of us who are willing to engage in this work, we have to be prepared for the opposition that is going to respond inevitably the deeper that we get. And so to answer your question, I do think that deep equity is sustainable in higher education. But as we were just saying, I think that sustainability comes from our ability to extend beyond just the boundaries of the academy and to really develop those deep root relationships with our community. Um, I'm an educator. Because I'm an educator, I see myself as a healer, someone who heals through the medium of education. Uh, I understand that um, my desired uh, audience as an educator are our youth because our youth you know, we have a saying here in California, the youth are the truth. Um, and I really believe that, that they hold our future. And so if the things that I'm doing in this higher ed environment aren't reaching back and touching the lives of those young people, then I think that that is not sustainable, right? Equity that, that only exists within our hallways is not sustainable. Equity that invites non-traditional folks into the room, into the building, right? Just imagine looking up and seeing people who traditionally haven't had the opportunity to be invited into your campus, into your building, into your office. To have those folks now roaming the hallways that's when you know the equity that we're working on in higher education becomes sustainable. And I think we have to be willing to lose ourselves to the popularity contest that exists with um, the higher order theorizing and pontification that comes in higher ed, right? Like, like I don't mean, I don't mind being unpopular because I got the little homies with me. Because what I lose in popularity at the higher ed level, I gain in credibility at the community level. And, and for me, that's really important because my entire life, I feel like black men in academia have often been characterized in negative ways by their community because they see us as losing touch. He not one of us no more. He didn't got up there, he didn't got educated. And I, and I don't wanna lose touch because maintaining that connection is where I maintain my edge. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. half the stuff that I think that I think and say in these spaces is because of the conversations that I have in the barbershop or the conversations that I have watching the Warriors play, you know, like the conversations that I get to have with folks that don't have PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> and they start talking to me and they ask questions in such a real and honest way that it really makes you like, oh, I forgot. And so, I mean, I, I don't want to ramble, but but I hope that answers your question, Dr. Gill, just in terms of like, I really do believe that it is sustainable, but I also believe that uh, it is possible to lose yourself, but lose yourself in ways that, you know, allow you to make the work sustainable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have to 
to keep coming back to that. I, I'm going to say that, you know, I feel the same way, but you have to, you know, um, constantly bring yourself back to um, doing that because you can get lost. I, I think the environment sometimes will um, dictate uh, whether it's publish or perish or whether somehow you're doing this or you're on that panel or you do whatever. And so you get lost in that. And so one of the things when you say you're walking with your little homies is that they make it so real. They bring it back to, you know, like context and they call it. Okay. And so <laughs> you always need, I mean, that's one of the things that we, you always need somebody to pull your coat. Okay. And so like, Oh, you know, bring it back, bring it back. And, and, and you're right. I think that, you know, and, and that's why I started with this knowing folks, because here, you know, you can walk around, you can be in a meeting and but folks will make you think like you like what all this experience you bring in, what you have brought in from the barbershop, from the beauty shop, from just walking in the neighborhood, that somehow that's not valid. OK, because it isn't, quote unquote, you know, from another Ph.D. or, you know, this, but yeah, you know, th that's out there. But no, it, it helps. To, to, to go that and that's that you know um, you know being being bilingual being able to code switch being able to understand and it keeps you in check uh, and you always have to do that I think in higher ed that's what we do to stay sane so I ask you as you think about um, where do you want to go? Like, okay, we did this series and this was new for us, okay? This, this, was, the, this was our first time at collaboration. It's the first time, I think, for, you know, tour universities, both in New York and California, to have this kind of uh, uh, interaction in the sense of, because we perhaps do it in other areas, around this, this whole issue of diversity. And as much as, you know, the each one of those sessions, the five sessions, as we've said before, was so deep. So now, given all of this, and you may not know exactly right now, because you know we both are going to think and ruminate and 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 um, reflect on this. But where would you want um, to go next? You know, that's a great question. Um, I think. We talked about it, you know, sometimes in the planning of things, it takes so much effort to get the plane off the ground that inevitably some luggage gets left behind. <laughs> and for me, the luggage in this uh, instance is the, the classroom piece that we wanted to do in between the sessions. Uh, this conversation that we're having today has been so rich that it just makes me realize we missed an opportunity to have these rich conversations uh, in between those guest speakers uh, from, this, from this series. And so um, one, I think, uh, you know, just a little bit of family business. I think that it is great that we had an opportunity, Toro, California and Toro, New York, to collaborate on this series. Um, there are so many differences, but so many similarities between the West and East Coast and to be able to make that connection, I think was truly invaluable. And I would love for us to be able to do it again next year. I would love for us to be able to do it again next year to really tap into, you know, local regional experts around these topics. Um, but then to really begin to expand and see how we can move from lecture-based to a project-based series, right? How can we actually begin to take uh, these lectures 
and develop projects around them so that at the end of whatever time frame, we're not just clapping our hands and saying, look, look what a great series we've had, but we can actually point to something tangible and say, look at what we've built. Mm -hmm. Look at how as a collaborative, we took the words of these individuals, these thought partners and actually created something with our students and our community that we know is going to be sustainable in the long run, right? Um, my conversations in the last few days has just been about consistency. And so I think, you know, ultimately we have to just do it again. We, we can't allow life and the chaos of life to get us to a place where it's like, we just can't do it, it's too much. I think we have to do it again because it is in the consistency of doing it again that I think we really are going to be able to tap in um, to another layer of what deep really is, right? Like however deep you go, you can always go deeper. And, and that's really what uh, I'm looking for. And like I said, just seeing how we, you know, everybody does le lecture series. And I don't even know what a project series would look like, but I think we have the partners in you all to be able to explore that and to be able to think about how are we more intentional about the reflection piece and making sure that our communities are actually growing because we are dissecting the information that we're getting and, and thinking in very tangible ways, how do we apply it to our lives uh, immediately? Thank you for that. Um, I agree. I do think we have to do it and think about how to, I mean, I like your idea. Um, how do we move this from, uh, you know, a, a lecture base or a, a conversation of words and perhaps, um, you know, flow that into action that can be kind of triggered out. And so whether that is, you know, often um, recently uh, and, um, Dr. Uh, Bullmaster Day is uh, from my institution. And, um, you know, we, we were thinking about going for this uh, teacher quality uh, program, that federal grant. And so the, the partnerships, and one of the things that, you know, I thought about is, uh, again, I really do need to find out, you know, where are the HSIs <laughs> in, 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 in just this geographic area, perhaps partner with them in terms of a conversation. Um, and then I'm sure, cause New York is, uh, is not, a, a, you know, according, uh, of course it's not a state that has a, um, uh, a deeper, I mean, a, a large number of um, indigenous people, but we do have some is that how do we make those things come to fruition? Uh, I am interested in the, the neurodiversity in terms of really helping people to think about that and how that interacts in, in what you're talking about, this interaction, this back and forth. Um, what might we know more about that that can actually change how we have regulation of ourselves so that we can co-regulate with others so that we can go deeper and connect with others in a different in, in a deeper way and so those are some of the you know just ideas of how do we take this and um, i think the series is so good so perhaps if we plan something for next spring i you know perhaps i'll think about how we can go deeper this fall in preparation for that so, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. And I'm glad we both are on the same page. We definitely running it, running it back. Um, this is, you know, it, it, it's been phenomenal. Um, I've, I've gained a lot from it and, um, uh, you know, 
the reason why I got into education is because I love learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone told me that there was an opportunity for me to build a career off of the idea that I could be a lifelong long, long learner. And that's what I get an opportunity to do. And so uh, if anything, I want to do it again, just so I can continue learning and growing um, and be a better person for myself and for my daughter and for the community that I serve. And so uh, I'm grateful to you uh, because you, you know, were willing to work with us and, and work with me and uh, we're so diligent in, in communicating. And so thank you. And thank you to all of your colleagues. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you to uh, those who joined us today. I, I, uh, I really appreciate your continued support and, you know, look forward to being even better for you all next year. And thank you. Uh, thank you for saying that. I enjoy working with you as well. Uh, I know that we haven't met in person, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to continue this conversation. And uh, it was, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Best uh, kind of hooked us up again, connections, relationships. She was like, oh, you have to know him. You, you have to meet him. And so uh, that has been wonderful. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Marcella, I know you had a question in there. I will say that uh, we don't have time for the examples or around, but again, I think, you know, a, a part of the conversation as you talked about it is perhaps you having the conversation with your white colleagues and deepening it because it doesn't always have to come from this end. Um, uh, I think people expect us to have this conversation and so the idea is that when we lead it, then folks say, oh, you know, that's like Velma and, you know, Dr. Ijeoma doing their things again. Um, but I really do appreciate all of you who've shown up for this, uh, the conversation. If you haven't looked at it, I would say take a, um, uh, and I don't know uh, if you can put the, the um, link in the, in the chat box, but look at the series. It is a wonderful series. Um, I learned a lot because it just came from different aspects of this whole conversation of the equity. Um, and so um, uh, we have posted all of the recordings. And so we invite you to, you know, just do that. Maybe just take a, you know, one episode. They were only an hour. Um, and talk with your colleagues about it and see, you know, about taking it further. And so thank you. I really appreciate being a part of this and look forward to interacting with all of you uh, at some point. All right. Well, that is uh, our time. Uh, thank you all again. Please enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. If you're on the East Coast, uh, get you a good dinner in and a safe <laughs> ride home. Uh, and we will see you all soon. All right. Bye-bye.